Hey guys, before we begin our video today, I do want to go through and do some tattoo praising. This one is from Joe Carpenter Tattoo of a Skeleton Samurai. And I think it is absolutely badass. This next one is from Michael Tagwe, and it is of Dave Grohl. And the face he captured of Dave Grohl, I don't know if you guys are Foo Fighter fans, but absolutely perfect. And this last one is by Rafa Tattoos. And this Terminator one really blows me away. Hello everybody, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me this week. The case we're talking about today, um, I actually got a tip from somebody who has been very kind to me. And actually, um, if you guys know her, it's Vanessa. I think a lot of you guys are actually here because of her. So she told me, you should look into this case because it's really fascinating. Now, a lot of true crime junkies, you guys probably already know about this clay case, but I'm going to go further into it. So this is the case of Jamie Kloss. To begin, this all starts in Barron, Wisconsin, a very small town in Wisconsin. And I'll show the Google Earth footage here. And it is October 2018. There is a 911 call received from Jamie's mother and it cuts out. So the cops fly over to where their house is. On the way there, they see something very interesting. And I'm going to show you this footage here. And I want you to keep it in mind as our story progresses. Pay special attention to this car we're about to pass. Keep watching. And those headlights, that's a big part of our story. Now the police pull up. They see the door shot through. Jamie's father dead on the chair and her mother dead in the bathtub. But there is no Jamie, no sign of her. So at this point, we have a double homicide and a missing 13-year-old girl. After entering the front door... Sheriff's office, who's inside? Deputies find James and Denise Kloss dead and no suspect in sight. We, we have the house. Okay. Only two we found. Okay. Whoever so, was here is gone. I'm assuming. So the whole town is completely shaken by it. There's really no leads. There's not a whole lot to go off of. It was all quite strategic. Well, there was a memorial going on for Jamie's parents. 32-year-old Kyle, I'm going to try and say his name here the best, but I honestly don't give a shit that much. Um, Janky Annis, hell of a name, broke into the Claus's now sitting empty home. The cops, of course, totally detain him and question him. They think they may have their suspect, but after quite thorough questioning, they figure out that Kyle is just being an asshole and breaking into the Claus's household because he knows they're dead and picking out their belongings. So there was no lead for many, many days. There was no sign of Jamie. There was, you know, this horrific murder of her parents and a missing girl. And as we all know, the longer we can't find a missing person, statistically, it's worse and worse for them being alive. At this point, it has now been 88 days. A woman named Jean. Sorry, guys, her name is Jean. I just couldn't handle this. This is obviously editing Andrea, but her name is Jean. Forgive me. Ann Nutter was walking her dog in January. It was quite frigid out. It was about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius, so I apologize for literally the rest of the world. Sorry about it. Um, but Jan is walking her dog, and this young girl runs up to her frantically and goes, you have to help me. You have to help me. Please, please help me. Now, Jan immediately knows something is wrong because this girl, it's cold out. Like I said, this is a January winter in Wisconsin. If you know about that area, you know it gets brutal up there. So at this point... Jeanne is a formal, former social worker, so she's really she's really smart in this situation. Like, so many props to Jeanne. She questions this girl, and we figure out it's Jamie. Jamie has ran up to Jeanne. Now, the information Jeanne got from, and I might be saying her name wrong, but her last name is Nutter. Um, she concluded the best route would to be get her, would to not be to take her to her cabin because the place that she was being detained by her assailant bordered her property. So they went to the neighbor of Jean or Jean. I'm so sorry. Um, and a 911 call. County 911. Hi. 
I have um, a young lady at my house right now, and she just says her name is Jamie Cloth. Okay, what's your address? One four. It's in Gordon, Wisconsin. Okay, have you seen her photo, ma'am? Yes, it Does is her. I 100% think it is her. Are you, okay. 100%. Does it look like she's going to run? No, she's sitting down, she's relaxing. Okay, hang on just a second. What's your name? Yep. What's your name, ma'am? Kristen Kaczynski. Kristen, how do you spell your last name? K-A-S-I-N-S. K-A-S. Okay, did she show up walking? Yeah, a neighbor just walked up with her to our house and asked us to call 911. Okay, hang on just a second. Are you cold? Do you need a blanket or anything? Okay. Do you need anything to drink or water or anything? Okay. Kristen, is the neighbor that walked her up, is she still there? Yes, she is. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Jeannie Mutter. I was, we have a cabin up here in Gordon on Oak Okay, ma'am, ma'am. And I was ma'am. walking. Yes. Okay, can I just get your name? Jeannie Nutter, N-U-T-T-E-R. Okay, and do you have a cabin address? Uh, 121. I mean, we don't, I'm not up here very often in the winter. I just happened to come up today. Okay. And I didn't want to bring her to my cabin. Because so how did she come up upon your cabin? I was walking my dog, and we were almost home, and she was walking towards me crying, saying, you got to help me, you got to help me. Okay. So I didn't want to go into my cabin because it's too close to Patterson's house. And she said her, her name is Janie Claus? Yep. And when I walked into this house, they recognized her immediately from the police. Okay. Oh, yeah, I got it. I'm not So I don't, Jamie, do you know when he's going to come back? She thought he was going to come back home at midnight. Who is, who is going to come back? What, his name is Jake Patterson. Kristen Kasanakis. Once again, I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, was the one who actually placed the phone call for Jamie to the police. Um, and I'm going to insert a clip. Thank you for joining us. We have incredible breaking news tonight. 13-year-old Jamie Kloss has been found alive just an hour north of her home in Barron, Wisconsin. She'd been missing for almost three months. Jamie was found this afternoon after the Douglas County Sheriff's Office received a call from a citizen and just minutes later, a suspect was taken into custody. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office in Wisconsin says she was found just outside the small town of Gordon in a development called Eau Claire Acres. The town of Gordon is about an hour north of Jamie's hometown of Barron. The news broke just before 8 o'clock tonight on the Barron County Sheriff's Facebook page. Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald says his department was notified by the Douglas County Sheriff's Department that Jamie had been found. People in Barron and surrounding communities are stunned tonight that after months of searching, Jamie is alive. What was your reaction when you heard the news? I, I, I cried. I, I sat down on the bench. Um, I was, I mean, I'm shocked. We've had so much bad news this year. Um, well, no, it's 2019, so it's good year. It's good news in 2019. Um, it's what we've prayed for every single day for the last 87 days. Yeah. Or whatever it is, 87, 88, I can't even remember. Did, did, it reach, did it reach a point where you were bracing yourself for bad news or anything like no, that? No, no, I honestly, I honestly, um, I honestly had faith. I, I, I figured if they hadn't found her by now that the person that, that did this didn't want her dead. So I had hope every day. Every day there was hope. Just tell me what you're going, th what you're going through right now and how you heard well, the news and how you reacted. We were... We were it was uh, just unbelievable because, you know, you, you, you hear about, it, 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 you know, you're not sure if she's going to be found or going to be found. And then when you actually hear it, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And we're all, all just so grateful and happy. Are you in shock? Yes. And I think that's part of it too, you know, is it was like, no, it's just, it's just great. We did, we, we thought it was going to be a different ending and we're so happy that, you know, that's hopefully she's okay. We don't really know what shape she's in or, you know, what, we don't really know a lot. All we know is that she's alive. It was such a huge deal to find her alive and 
physically unharmed. Now, when the cops showed up and everything, Jamie was able to say who this person was. His name was Jake Thomas Patterson. Now, he was a 21-year-old ex-Marine. I guess he only lasted five weeks, and it was actually from the area. Um, in the yearbook, he was voted the most quiet and reserved. Um, another crazy thing is Kristen, like I said, who had placed the 911 call for Jamie and Mrs. Nutter, um, was actually a teacher at the middle school where he had gone, but she didn't even, she wasn't aware of him. He was so quiet, like even though he had been in that town, nobody really knew him. So the cops come after him right away and they find him and he confesses immediately. Now there was a strange interaction that Jake had in the police car. He acted puzzled why he was arrested, which was weird, but that's really the only time he kind of doesn't quote unquote be truthful. So there's that. Um, Patterson is detained and he admits to the murders and he admits to capturing Jamie. Hey guys, so it's me again. Remember that car I brought up? I'm going to insert footage of that track right now. 12.53 a.m. Deputies respond to a 911 call on Highway 8 and without knowing, pass Jake Patterson's car less than a minute away from the Kloss home. Newly released audio also reveals that investigators on scene discussed the car that they saw back on Highway 8. Do you want to run and download and try to see if you can pull any plates of cars going that way? That maroon car that yielded? Yeah, you're right. You, yeah, I had it at 54. The deputy is describing, again without knowing, Patterson's car. Patterson later told investigators he removed the license plates from his red Ford Taurus and replaced it with a stolen plate so that he would not, quote, get stopped or spotted with his own license plates on his car. It was really weird what he was doing. He claimed he never sexually assaulted her, but he kind of kept her as like a forced companion slave. Like they would stay and play video games and stuff. But if, or not video games, I'm sorry, board games. But if his parents were over or any family or any friends, he would make her hide in his bedroom without food or water for sometimes hours and she wasn't allowed to leave. So she was like a captive companion. Now, this is just going to get more and more bizarre. I mean, murderers usually have at least one of those elements in it. He had been working at a cheese factory. I know how stereotypical in Wisconsin, right? But he had been working at a cheese factory. And one day he was either coming to or from work. And he had to stop for the school bus, letting the middle schoolers out. And he saw Jamie and became fixated on her. He decided he had to have her. So he strategically set up a plan to do exactly what he did. When the FBI agents spoke about how this crime went down, they said Jake was not in the house for any more than four minutes. And what had happened is he saw Jamie's dad on the couch. So he shot him right through the head. Now, Jamie's mother heard this, cradled Jamie in her arms and got in the bathtub. They were both in there. This is when that 911 call was placed. At this point, Jake makes his way to the bathroom. He pulls Jamie's mother, her mother, I should say, tapes her up and shoots Jamie's mom in the head and leaves with Jamie. Um, he had thought far enough ahead. He had his shitty red car and he had stolen plates so he couldn't be traced to it. His motivation, he claims, is he just wanted companionship. It was all really, really... So at this point, we're fast forwarding to the trial. We will also go over how Jamie was able to escape within the trial. So I don't want you guys to think I'm skipping over that. We're going to see footage and some statements that go over that. So that will be included in this. Oh, Jake wanting to clear his name in one way or another. Not that he fucking could because he was a psycho ass. And I literally just told you what he did. And it was disgusting. Wrote a letter to a local reporter. Now, what I'm going to do right now is play you that footage of the reporter he sent the letter to 
and what I can't believe I did this. Those are the words that came in a letter from the man charged with kidnapping Jamie Kloss and killing her parents, Jim and Denise. That letter arrived at CARE 11 for our Lou Bergoose this morning from the Polk County Jail and inmate Jake Patterson. Lou is here to explain how all of this transpired and I think a lot of people want to know, uh, Lou, did Jamie's family know about this letter ahead of time? Yes, Randy and Julie, I had a conversation today with Jennifer Smith, Jamie's aunt and guardian. She told me the sheriff let her know about the letter before we even received it. I wrote to Patterson initially to ask him many of the questions many of you out there were asking us. And this morning when this letter arrived, I took every measure I could to confirm that it did indeed come from Patterson. A source very close to the case said that this red stamp on the envelope is consistent with jail mail protocol. And that protocol prevents anyone from sending a fake letter since all mail is reviewed. So what's in the letter? Let's walk through it together. The letter begins by saying, Lou, hi. I don't know if I'll actually send this. I'll answer some of your questions. Some I can't. I won't put a lot of details anyways. There are some sections that are scribbled out. And at the bottom, Jake Patterson writes, that means self-redaction. My first question to Patterson was, why did you confess when you were caught? And why did you confess in such detail? His answer, I knew when I was caught, which I thought would happen a lot sooner, I wouldn't fight anything. I tried to give them everything, wasn't completely honest, so they didn't have to interview Jamie. They did anyways and hurt her more for no reason. My next question, what is your plan now? Plead guilty or take the case all the way to trial? His answer, plead guilty. I want Jamie and her relatives to know that. Don't want them to worry about a trial. Was actually going to on the 6th, which was Patterson's last court hearing. But in a case like this, it's not really allowed. So the judge moved it to the 27th of March. What led you to want to kidnap a girl in the first place? His answer, it's not black and white. I asked, do you have any remorse or regrets for the things that you did? His answer, huge amounts. A section is scribbled out. Then, I can't believe I did this. What was your long-term plan if Jamie had not escaped that day? Won't say. It was really stupid, though, looking back. Did you confide in anyone or leave any hints that people failed to pick up on? He answers, no, and more words are scribbled out. Then I asked, did your family really have no clue? How often were family members in your cabin, and how close did they come to discovering Jamie under the bed? The answer, no one knew. My dad only came on Saturdays the same time every day, so it was a routine. Jamie hides on Saturday. My family respects privacy, so no one even went in my room. I asked, did you ever return to Barron after the crime or insert yourself in any of the vigils or anything being held in Jamie's honor? Did you ever get close to her family following the shootings and kidnapping? He answers, I stayed away from Barron. How closely did you follow the news coverage? And was Jamie aware of the news coverage and the extent to which people were searching for her? His answer, I followed it through my phone. If something popped up on TV about it, I would change the channel and would tell Jamie, I'm sorry, I can't watch this. I don't know what she knew. Authorities said Patterson planned the crimes in great detail, including shaving his head to avoid leaving evidence at the scene. So I asked Patterson, when in your life did you realize you were capable of doing something like this? I explained that I had just watched a special on the BTK killer and that he told a reporter he knew as a teen he wanted to do something like this one day and was jealous over attention other killers like Ted Bundy were receiving. I asked Patterson if he felt any of those same thoughts. Patterson's answer, the cops say I planned this thoroughly and that I said that. They're really good at twisting your words around, put them in different spots, straight up lie, a little mad about that, trying to cover up their mistakes, I guess. This was mostly on impulse. I don't think like a serial killer. And my last question was, what goes through the mind of somebody who wants to carry out something like this? His answer, at the time, I was really pissed. I didn't, quote, want to. A couple words are scribbled out. And then the reason I did this is complicated. The final sentence on the letter says, no one will believe or can even imagine how sorry I am for hurting Jamie this much. Can't express it. Then on the back, in bubble letters, it says, I'm sorry, Jamie, for everything. I know it doesn't mean much. Now, some of this was read in the trial, and many people notated that Patterson's last, he kind of had a last little spicy-ass exchange with the judge or attempted to, and it was like his last little shred of any type of dominance he could have in the world before he went to prison. Um, I'm definitely going to insert trial footage here. You are the embodiment of evil. 
and the public can only be safe if you are incarcerated until you die. Powerful words from Judge James Babbler just moments before he sentenced Jake Patterson to two life sentences, plus 25 years in prison for kidnapping Jamie Kloss and brutally murdering her parents, all to be served consecutively. It was an emotional day, hearing from the Kloss family and a brave statement from Jamie read by the family's attorney. Lou Raguse was in the courtroom today, joins us live from Barron tonight. Lou? Randy, Jake Patterson knew he would receive life in prison and he seemed to be okay with that. His attorneys argued for the possibility of parole when he turned 100 years old, but the judge rejected that. Now inside that courtroom, we had to envision all the brutal details of Patterson's crime in great detail. And the district attorney showed photos of the murder weapon, the matching shotgun shells, the front door he shot open after killing Jim Kloss, and then the bathroom door he smashed open to kill Denise and take Jamie. A powerful moment during the hearing came when the attorney for Jamie Kloss herself read a statement from her, her own words, talking about everything that was taken from her the night she was kidnapped, including her parents, saying, Patterson took them away from me forever. But Jamie also showed hope in her message about her future and the things Patterson can't take from her. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave and he was not. He can never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life, and he will not. Jake Patterson will never have any power over me. I feel like I have some power over him because I get to tell the judge what I think should happen to him. And going into the today's hearing, there were still some questions about Patterson's motive. His attorney said that he had a psychologist look at him and said that he's not a psychopath, he's not a sociopath. But before handing down the sentence, the judge said something just chilling that Patterson apparently wrote while in his jail cell saying that he had fantasies of kidnapping multiple girls and killing multiple families, that the only thing that stopped him before was the fear of, of hell. But then he stopped believing in God, and he stopped fighting the fantasies. Not only were you a danger to the Kloss family, you are an extreme danger to the public in general. There is no doubt in my mind that you are one of the most dangerous men to ever walk, on this planet. Today's hearing was two hours long and it was very emotional, especially at the beginning when we heard from Jamie's aunts and uncles. They talked about the fear that they experienced after the crime was committed, not knowing if they would be targeted as well. They couldn't sleep at night. And then they talked a lot about how devastating the loss of Jim and Denise has been to them. Back to you. Hey, Lou, there was a time uh, you alluded to what the judge was reading in the uh, courtroom today uh, when Patterson was really visibly, it seemed, upset and said something that was inaudible that we could not hear, mm -hmm. but maybe people in the courtroom could hear. Can you just talk a little bit about what that was? Exactly. He actually interrupted the judge to say, why don't you read the rest of the letter? He said, I wrote a lot more things in that letter and you're just ignoring it. And then after that, the judge ignored him and continued with his sharp rebuke and handed down the sentence. Okay, very good. Thank you, Lou. Jake mm -hmm. Patterson did speak briefly near the end of the sentencing. Here is what he said to the judge and those in the courtroom. I would do like absolutely anything to take back what I did, you know. I, mean, I would die. I would do absolutely anything to to bring them back, you know. I don't care about me, I just, I'm just so sorry. Gloss family and the Barron County Sheriff reacting to the sentence in a news conference just in the last 90 minutes. Jamie's aunt says the lifetime sentence for Patterson will help Jamie heal. So after all of that, at this point, um, Jamie is now in her aunt's custody and doing well or as well as she can be for going through what she went through. 
Another lovely follow-up for Jake is some of you know. Now, this is a couple years ago now. There have been transfers. But Jake and Chris Watts, old Dead Eyes himself, who actually that whole crime took place less than half an hour away from me. That hit home hard. But they became best friends. And the reason why they had to become best friends is when you go to prison... If you harm minors or if your offenses are against minors, you are viewed as the bottom of the fucking barrel and you will get your ass beat. So those two had to pair up and it was said that they, you know, they were, they would go strolls during wreck and people would yell shit at them and, and Jake tried to be all tough and Chris would calm him down. So there's a match made in hell if I've ever heard one in my life. Um, like I said, or like the footage said, he's serving two life terms plus 40 years. The last news story was he had been transferred to a holding facility in New Mexico. And I will insert this footage here. Once again, like I said, if you hurt kids in prison, you are shit. So he got his ass beat. <laughs> he, he definitely was trying to do headlocks and stuff, but he definitely, uh, I don't think that round, got, got uh, schooled pretty good by a fellow inmate before they shot the beanbag gun at both of them to break it up. So all in all, I'm glad he's rotting in prison. And I think it's just a really weird, sad messed up thing like and this guy was just so under the radar because he was so quiet nobody suspected a thing the whole thing is absolutely crazy um i'm glad jamie is physically safe i feel so bad for her having to experience everything she went through uh to see that with your parents and having your childhood taken away from you and literally being enslaved by some creep ass dude who just decided you were going to be his pet when you got off the school bus this just rocked the hell out of the town and uh i really hope he gets his ass beat a little bit more in prison i got no issues with it so um tell me if you guys have heard this story before uh i know a lot you know if you were close to it at the time if you've been keeping up with it all that stuff would be great um thank you so thank you so much for watching and have a great day or evening and i'll see you in the future Bye-bye.